This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 per month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. This trial made the Green Bay Press-Gazette top stories of 1999. Locals have strong feelings about this case. Some feel the defendant was 100% guilty. Others think the state's witness was guilty. And many think the victim died from a failed suicide attempt that turned successful because of excessive alcohol use and careless smoking. You're listening to Episode 72, Sandra Maloney. On Wednesday, February 11th, 1998, Lola Cater made the trip from her home in Madison, Wisconsin, to her daughter's house in Green Bay. Her daughter, Sandra Maloney, had a pretty big day. She was getting divorced and was due in court for a hearing. The final divorce was supposed to take place later that month, on the 20th. Her daughter was having a difficult time in dealing with the divorce and custody issues. The back and forth had gotten ugly. Lola arrived at Sandra's east side home on 268 Hooth Street, just after 10 a.m. When she saw the home, she was immediately distressed. There had been a fire. Lola walked inside and found her 40-year-old daughter was face down, lifeless, and partially charred on the living room couch. The Green Bay Police Department arrived at the Hooth Street address, and they placed crime scene tape around the tan, one-story brick home. Detectives spent that day investigating the woman's death, while fire inspectors tried to determine the cause of the fire. The fire started the night before in the living room and burned itself out. It caused approximately $50,000 worth of damage to the house. The investigators initially believed careless smoking caused the fire. The assistant fire chief said that the fire extinguished itself because of a lack of oxygen. Neighbors were surprised when fire trucks rumbled down their street and stopped at Sandra Maloney's house. One of her neighbors had been up late watching TV and peered out of the window at 12.30 a.m., which was his habit prior to going to bed. Everything appeared to be normal. The police and firefighter presence surprised another neighbor since they had not seen smoke or noticed that anything was out of place. Sandra had been their neighbor for about 13 years. A Green Bay police lieutenant said that there had been nothing suspicious about the death or fire. But Sandra Maloney was the wife of Green Bay police detective John Maloney. John and Sandra were divorcing and weren't living together. Because Sandra Maloney was the wife of a police officer, Investigators wanted to ensure they looked at this tragedy from every angle. On February 12, 1998, 41-year-old John Maloney took bereavement leave from work. On February 13, 1998, a pathologist could not determine the cause of Sandra Maloney's death. They were still waiting for toxicology and tissue test results. Detectives took photos and videos of the Hooth Street home to aid the medical examiner. Initially, they believed that smoking material started the fire, but now they were uncertain. Law enforcement quickly changed their tune and labeled the death and fire suspicious. GBPD turned the case over to the Wisconsin Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigation. The police chief, James Lewis, reassured the community that bringing in state-level investigators did not make Detective John Maloney a suspect. This was a standard procedure when the incident involved a family member of an officer to avoid conflicts of interest. On February 14, 1998, they held a memorial service for Sandra at the Proco Wall Funeral Home on East Mason Street in Green Bay. Sandra Cater was born on July 30, 1957, in Madison, Wisconsin, 
to Lola and Laverne Cater. She moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin, and graduated from Preble High School in 1976. Sandra met John Maloney in high school, and they started dating. In 1978, she married John Maloney in a Catholic ceremony at St. Bernard Church. Their initial years of marriage were happy. Sandra worked as a secretary, while John finished an associate's degree in criminal justice, then took a job with the GBPD. Sandra loved and lived for her three boys. She was a warm and compassionate person. Sandra was a stay-at-home mom who enjoyed volunteering at her kids' school. John eventually became a detective for the GBPD and was an investigator on their arson task force. In the early 1990s, Sandra woke up with a stiff neck. She suffered from neurological issues and worried that her symptoms could be related to multiple sclerosis. After seeing many specialists, she was prescribed clonopin, which was an anti-anxiety medication that she developed an addiction to. Sandra suffered from a panic disorder and depression. As the years ticked by, her addiction grew and expanded into alcohol and other medications. Sandra drank heavily and had stays in psych wards and did stints in rehab. She wrecked vehicles when she shouldn't have been driving. John warned their sons to never get in the car with their mom if she was acting strange. In May 1997, John had enough and moved out of their east side Green Bay home. He started dating a woman named Tracy Hellenbrand, who was a 28-year-old IRS agent. John filed for divorce a month later and wanted full custody of their children. Officers had been called to the Maloney's house 16 times since 1991. There were several reasons for the calls, including prowlers, loud music, or issues with neighbors. Sometimes the Maloney's made the call, but other times neighbors called the police on the Maloney's. Neighbors were upset that John was given special treatment by police for the neighborhood complaints. Police conducted an internal investigation and determined that the complaints were handled appropriately. Every time police were dispatched to the Maloney house, they instructed officers to file a thorough report and notify a supervisor. The divorce increasingly became difficult on top of their already volatile relationship. On July 10, 1997, police were called to Sandra's home over a domestic disturbance involving John. By the time police arrived, John was leaving with their three kids, so they considered the situation resolved. The Maloney's could not agree on the custody of the three boys or spousal maintenance payments. John wanted to get the divorce finalized and was upset at Sandra's attempts to delay the process. He even told one of his co-workers that he was at a breaking point with the divorce and didn't know how much more he could take. On February 10, 1998, John Maloney met with his attorney and learned that he might have to pay Sandra $700 per month in support payments. His pension was also at risk. It was worth $80,000 and Sandra could get awarded up to half. John was responsible for 50% of their debt, which totaled $30,000. They owed $23,000 to Sandra's mother and $12,000 to his girlfriend, Tracy. John Maloney told his attorney that this was not fair and that Sandra didn't even work. On February 11, 1998, on the day Sandra was found dead, Her lawyer moved to withdraw the divorce petition, but the judge denied the motion. Sandra had not shown up for court. Investigators contacted John and told him that his estranged wife had died. They questioned John a few times in the days after Sandra's death. He said he was at home with his two younger sons and his girlfriend Tracy Hellenbrand. John was putting together bunk beds for the kids. He left the house to pick up his oldest son from baseball practice right before 8 p.m. on February 10th. On February 20th, 1998, the Wisconsin Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigation labeled the fire an arson. 
The state crime lab was analyzing evidence from the house, and pathologists were still working on the autopsy report. They were considering suicide and homicide. The pathologists hadn't ruled out accidental and natural causes of death. But after DCI declared the fire an arson, these causes of death were less likely. Investigators saw the scorching of windpipes and soot in the lungs when people died in house fires. They found very little soot in Sandra's lungs. The toxicology results were still pending and were the key in confirming if the smoke caused Sandra's death or perhaps the couch cushion acted as a filter since they found her face down. On February 26, 1998, the Brown County Medical Examiner, Greg Schmonk, officially labeled Sandra Maloney's cause of death a homicide. She had little soot in her lungs, and her carboxyl hemoglobin was 6%, which was reasonable and low for a person who was a heavy smoker, as Sandra was. Investigators believe she was likely dead or close to death prior to the fire. Her drug screen was negative, but her blood alcohol concentration was 0.25%, which was 2.5 times the legal driving limit for 1998. Sandra had bruises on her body and other injuries. John Maloney's bereavement leave quickly turned into paid administrative leave while the investigation was continuing. Sandra's mother, Lola Cater, felt a small amount of relief that her daughter didn't commit suicide, especially with her depression over the divorce. On June 1, 1998, the Brown County DA, John Zakowski, recused himself from the Maloney investigation and brought in a prosecutor from another jurisdiction. Winnebago County DA, Joe Paulus, stepped in to take over. When Zakowski was asked about John Maloney being a suspect, he said, We can't escape the fact that the deceased had a husband who was an arson investigator and that they were going through a divorce. But that's not to suggest there has been any determination yet that he was involved. The DA told the medical examiner to hold off signing Sandra's death certificate. He wanted to protect certain information around her death, since the investigation was ongoing. But a source leaked information to the Green Bay Press-Gazette that Sandra had marks on her neck and her death was due to a blunt force blow to the back of the head and strangulation or suffocation. Until this point, they had not buried Sandra yet, because detectives told the funeral home to hold her body in refrigeration. On June 3, 1998, Sandra Maloney's body was finally released because the district attorney was confident they secured all the potential evidence. Sandra's mother, Lola, was unsure about the burial plans because John was technically still married to Sandra and he was responsible for the arrangements. Lola wanted Sandra to be buried in Madison, Wisconsin, next to her father. On July 8, 1998, they questioned John Maloney again, and he was point-blank asked if he had anything to do with Sandra's death. He refused to answer the question. They warned Maloney that his lack of response would result in him being disciplined or even terminated. The next day, GBPD ended Maloney's administrative leave and placed him on paid suspension for insubordination and not cooperating with an internal police investigation. The police chief wanted to suspend Maloney without pay, but he did not have that option. On July 28th, Police arrested John Maloney at 8 p.m. in Las Vegas, Nevada, at the Continental Hotel. During the arrest, officers said Maloney was backing away, and they thought he was going to run, so they sprayed him with mace. They arrested him without a struggle. Maloney had been visiting his girlfriend in Las Vegas. Green Bay detectives worked with Las Vegas police and arrested him on charges related to homicide and arson. Green Bay Police Chief James Lewis said after placing Maloney on suspension two weeks ago, he had to either answer questions in an internal hearing or resign from his position. His two weeks were up, and the police chief filed a termination request with the Police and Fire Commission, who had the sole power to hire and fire officers. The police chief could only make recommendations.
Right after Sandra died, John Maloney's girlfriend, Tracy Helen Brand, approached police and offered to wear a wire to prove Maloney was innocent. However, over time, Tracy's feelings shifted. The more she spoke with investigators, the more they convinced her that Maloney wasn't innocent. She hired her own lawyer to protect her interests. Helen Brand even took a polygraph test. But during testing, she exhibited atypical behaviors. Helen Brand changed the pacing of her voice when answering questions. She looked away from her test giver and pursed her lips at various intervals. Police discovered Helen Brand researched and used certain techniques to ensure she passed the test. Eventually, Helen Brand agreed to help investigators with an undercover sting operation. She had lived in Vegas previously and moved there to get away from the media circus in Green Bay. She invited Maloney to visit her in late July. Investigators bugged her hotel room, room number 831 at the Lady Luck Motel, which is now called the Downtown Grant. They posted officers in room 829 and ran surveillance on Helen Brand's room. Maloney admonished her for dressing too provocatively when she picked him up from the airport. He was jealous and was worried that she was seeing another man. Helen Brand tried to get Maloney to admit that he killed his wife. In the initial conversations, he repeatedly denied any involvement in the murder. Their interactions were heated, and Maloney was angry with the accusations, so she stopped trying for the evening. One of Maloney's colleagues, Lieutenant Ken Brodhagen, was in Vegas and was watching the surveillance feed. He felt he saw a whole new side of Maloney that he wasn't accustomed to. Brodhagen felt Maloney had the traits of a typical domestic abuser. On the morning of July 27th, Helen Brand pressed Maloney again. Eventually, Maloney admitted he was in the house the day Sandra died. He said Sandra fell and hit her head. Helen Brand asked Maloney why he never called 911 before leaving. He didn't want his fingerprints on the phone. Maloney said the fire was an accident and he didn't know when it started. He said he went there to get the divorce done and to get it over with. Maloney didn't want the boys to suffer. This could have meant a variety of things, including that he was at Sandra's house to tell her to not drag her feet in court the next day so they could get the divorce done. Or he went to her house to murder her so they could be done. Detectives were confident that it was the latter, and they had him on videotape. Investigators called the prosecutor back in Wisconsin, who gave them the green light to arrest John Maloney. Maloney and Helen Brand parted ways, and he went back to his room at the Continental Hotel, where he was arrested. They charged John Maloney with first-degree intentional homicide, arson to a building, and mutilating a corpse. Famous defense attorney Gerald Boyle represented John Maloney. Boyle had defended several notable individuals, including serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, child-abusing priest Father John Faney, Green Bay Packer Mark Chimura, and Mike Hearn of the Monfile Six. Gerald's daughter, Bridget Boyle, was going to assist her father on the case. Boyle said his client was going to waive extradition so they could get him back to Wisconsin as soon as possible. In the criminal complaint, the state claimed the motive for the murder was Maloney killed his wife to avoid being financially ruined by the divorce. In early questioning, Maloney told authorities he had not been at Sandra's home on the day she died but now they had him on tape, admitting he lied. The fire started on the living room couch. Investigators said they found matches and paper napkins or tissues stuffed into and in front of the couch. Cloth material was wedged into the center section of the couch, leading to an area of deep charring on the floor between the couch and the coffee table. John Maloney's bond was set at $1 million. He was still suspended, but was getting paid by the police department. His termination hearing was scheduled for late August, so he resigned instead of getting fired. 
Gerald Boyle felt that resigning was a better option because per the rules of the termination hearing, Maloney could be called to testify, which might compromise his defense at his criminal trial. Maloney wrote a letter to the Green Bay police chief, tendering his resignation. I wish to tell you that I am neither guilty of a violation of any rule or regulation, nor am I guilty of murdering my wife. What saddens me most is the fact that certain words have been attributed to you that say I'm guilty of these crimes. As a law enforcement officer, I thought you believe in the presumption of innocence. You don't seem to hold that rule true when one of your own has been charged. I would have thought that you would have waited until the verdict was announced before attributing guilt. It does not speak well of you to have violated my rights to due process by indicating your belief of my guilt. It is for that reason I am resigning. I would never want to work for you again. Police Chief Lewis responded, I stand by anything I have said during this investigation and the treatment of John Maloney. If he felt he should get special treatment because he was a police officer, I disagree with that. This was investigated as a crime. The crime was Sandra Maloney as the victim. Anyone can review the videotape of the news conference. I was fair, and there wasn't anything that I said that wasn't factual. From the city standpoint, this personnel matter is closed. It may take a few days to get the books closed out, but it is for the most part closed. At that point, Maloney had earned $24,500 since being placed on leave from the GBPD. He would also be paid out for accumulated vacation time, but not for remaining sick leave. Maloney was in the Brown County Jail and had to be segregated from the main population because of his past profession of being a detective. Sandra's mother sued John Maloney. She had loaned the couple $28,497 for their mortgage payments and living expenses. Lola was seeking the funds directly from John Maloney and not from Sandra's estate. She did not want to take any inheritance money from her grandkids. Maloney claimed the money was a gift, and there was never a written loan agreement. He asked the judge to postpone the civil matter until after his criminal trial. Maloney's lawyer wanted to avoid any civil trial evidence which could be used against him in criminal court. The judge denied his request. John Maloney and Lola Cater eventually settled. Lola agreed to receive $12,000 from John Maloney and would put $5,000 in a trust for her three grandsons. On October 16, 1998, Peter Nas, the Brown County judge, changed Maloney's bail from $1 million to $250,000. Six of his family members agreed to put their houses up for collateral. Maloney had 40 family members in court, including his three sons. The judge received 36 letters asking him to reduce Maloney's bail. Winnebago County District Attorney Joe Paulus objected to the lower bail and said Maloney was a flight risk. The judge disagreed and said Maloney would stay with his sister Virginia in Green Bay and would, of course, be electronically monitored. Sandra's family was frustrated over a few issues that remained unresolved. She had been cremated, but they held her remains at the funeral home. Sandra's brother-in-law, Al Kennard, claimed the funeral director refused to release her ashes because they had not paid the bill. The funeral home director said the unpaid bill was not the issue, and he could not legally release Sandra's ashes to anyone but John Maloney, since he was the next of kin. The director said it wouldn't be ethical to hold the ashes ransom because of an unpaid bill, which would result in the loss of his license. Sandra's family apologized to the funeral home. John Maloney signed a release, which allowed Sandra's remains to be sent to the Alloway Catholic Cemetery and Chapel Mausoleum. Even though Lola Cater wanted her daughter to be buried in Madison, she was happy that Sandra could finally be at peace. Lola was upset that they couldn't get into Sandra's Hooth Street home. 
John Maloney went through the house and took what he wanted after investigators released the crime scene. But the property was in foreclosure, and the family was not allowed inside. Lola's last point of frustration was her lack of access to visit her three grandkids. She felt like Maloney was standing in the way of her seeing the boys. Not only had Lola lost her daughter, she felt they also had no rights in the matter. John Maloney's civil lawyer said they were following the recommendations of the court-approved attorney who was selected to represent the interests of the three Maloney boys. The attorney believed that Lola Cater's active participation with the prosecutor's office was detrimental to her relationship with the children. Bridget Boyle asked for a gag order on Lola Cater because Team Boyle felt she used the media to gain access to both her grandchildren and the Hooth Street home. The judge denied this request and said he couldn't restrict the First Amendment rights of the media or the Cater family. Team Boyle wanted to have a Brown County jury because John Maloney had an excellent reputation as a detective in the community. If the Cater family continued to bring personal issues to the media, they would consider asking for a change of trial venue. John Maloney had been fighting foreclosure on the Hooth Street property, and a judge delayed the sale of the home until March 19, 1999, after Maloney's February criminal trial. $64,700 was owed to Transamerica Financial Service and Fairbanks Capital Corp. for the mortgage, court costs, and other fees. Maloney stopped paying the mortgage in July, the same month he was arrested. Sandra Maloney's family finally got to walk through the dark, damaged home. Two police officers escorted them with flashlights, through the fire-torn property. The family took a few items, which reminded them of happier times. Christmas wreaths, a jewelry box, sweaters, and an afghan Lola had made for the family. At a pretrial hearing, important determinations about evidence were settled. The defense challenged the six-and-a-half-hour videotape with conversations between Maloney and his ex-girlfriend in Las Vegas, and they wanted the tape suppressed. Defense lawyer Gerald Boyle said Tracy Helen Brand was acting as a law enforcement officer when she attempted to get Maloney to confess because she had been a criminal investigator for the IRS. Boyle said intimidation and coercion were used, which violated Maloney's rights. The prosecution said the videotape was important, but it was only one part of the puzzle. They wanted to introduce other evidence that showed violence was escalating in the Maloney's marriage. Sandra was feeling emotionally beat down, and John Maloney was physically and verbally abusive. In 1996, Sandra Maloney told one of her doctors that she was scared for her life because her husband was beating her up. In September 1997, a social worker for the county said John Maloney threatened her by lining up bullets on her desk. Maloney allegedly said he had a bullet ready if he received a poor work performance report. Between July and October 1997, the Maloney's neighbors reported hearing verbal arguments in their home. The judge ruled that the Vegas videotape was admissible. He would disallow certain statements about domestic abuse. Some of it was hearsay, and there was no context in how it would be used. Court TV wanted to cover the Maloney case, but other large trials were filling their bandwidth. President Bill Clinton's Senate impeachment trial was set to take place during the Maloney trial. The judge ordered that all news cameras must shoot footage from the media room, which was in the back of the courtroom. The media would be required to use the court's microphones. With poor audio quality and no close-ups of people taking the stand, Court TV pulled the plug on covering the Maloney trial. The judge instituted a gag order on the lawyers once the trial started. He didn't want them talking to the media, which might cause issues with the jury. I have two dogs and two cats. Yes, you heard that correctly. My house is like a pet rescue. But when I have guests over, 
I don't want my home smelling like it's full of four-legged friends. This is why I use Scent Air Whisper Home Diffuser. It keeps my home smelling fresh and clean. And the good news is that my listeners can bring professional quality fragrance to all the spaces that matter, from business to home, with Scent Air. Scent Air diffusers are sleek and fill your space with vivid fragrance for up to 300 hours. The Scent Air app lets you schedule your fragrance and control your intensity right from your phone. All of Scent Air's more than 60 fragrances are phthalate-free, cruelty-free, and safe for kids and pets. This winter, try luxury home and fragrance trusted by the pros by going to scentair.com and using the promo code BEYOND for 25% off your first order. That's scentair.com, promo code B-E-Y-O-N-D. Forty-two-year-old John Maloney's trial started on February 8, 1999, and he previously entered a not-guilty plea. They brought in the first panel of jurors. Sixteen of the potential jurors had either met the lawyers, the Maloney's, or one of the 90 possible witnesses. Eventually, 15 jurors were picked, but they were not sequestered. The judge told them to avoid media reporting. Many of Sandra's family members had a pin with her picture on it and were instructed to remove it before the jury entered the room. Prosecutor Joe Paulus said that love, hate, obsession, control, money, stress, pressure, and rage came together all at once. And that was what led John Maloney to kill his wife. Maloney knew details that only the killer would have known, like the location of items, including vodka bottles in the room and birthday cards on an end table. He had the motive to kill Sandra because of the maintenance and child support payments he was going to owe her after the divorce was finalized. Paulus said that Maloney strangled Sandra until she was dead, placed her bloody shirt in a hamper in the basement, set the house on fire, and left half-smoked cigarettes to cover the crime. Gerald Boyle laid out the strategy for the defense. They believed that John Maloney's ex-girlfriend, Tracy Hellenbrand, killed Sandra Maloney. Boyle said that John Maloney became a lover beyond definition. There wasn't a river he wouldn't cross or a building he wouldn't rush into for Helen Brand. But she was becoming impatient because the divorce was dragging on. Money was an issue. Sandra was a problem. And Helen Brand was going to rid Maloney of those problems. Boyle said... Helen Brand used sex to coerce John Maloney into admitting he was at Sandra's the day she died. The courtroom was stunned by the accusations about Helen Brand. Sandra's family was shocked and never heard these details before. Lola Cater testified. She called her daughter on February 10, 1998, at 6.03 p.m. John was supposed to drop the boys off at her house, but Sandra was still waiting for them to show. Lola tried to call her daughter again at 8.26 p.m., but the answering machine picked up instead. On cross-examination, Boyle took Lola to task about minor details about if a door was locked or not the day she found her daughter. There were 18 Cater family members in the courtroom, and they were upset that Boyle was challenging Lola. One person whispered, She's answered that already. Leave her alone. The chief medical examiner testified that the person who killed Sandra likely choked her from behind, pushed her face down into the couch, and possibly placed their knee into her back. The killer squeezed so hard that the blood vessels in Sandra's eyes burst. They also struck her with a blunt object, which caused a two-inch gash on the top of her head. The blow might have rendered her unconscious. On cross-examination, the medical examiner admitted he couldn't determine if the injuries were caused by a 200-pound man or a 15-pound girl. The time of death could not be determined. Greg Egham, an arson investigator with the State Division of Criminal Investigation, said the fire started in three different spots with a wick-like material that was used to start the fire. He found wicks made of twisted tissue that were stuffed into the couch cushions and were also tossed behind the couch near the drapes. Egum believed 
that vodka may have been used to start the fire. In his opinion, the alcohol burned hot and clean and left little residue, so it was difficult to detect. He said that the person who set the fire may have set out cigarettes to give the appearance that Sandra fell asleep on the couch and started the fire inadvertently. The fire was oxygen-starved, so it put itself out. There was only one window cracked open in the home, and it wasn't enough to maintain the fire. Under cross-examination, Bridget Boyle argued that the arsonist knew little about setting fires, unlike John Maloney, who was an arson investigator. Agum responded by saying he once started a controlled fire that went out because he underestimated the amount of oxygen needed. Agum compared setting fires to freeing a beast that can't be controlled. Investigators estimated the fire was likely in progress around 7.30 p.m. because there had been known calls to the house and the fire caused the phone to malfunction. Sandra's friend, Lynn Stillman, called her house and received several busy signals. Then she left a message on Sandra's answering machine at 7.35 p.m. When police arrived the next morning, they found the phone was off the hook, but still rang a few times, despite being off the receiver. A representative for the phone manufacturer testified that under normal conditions, when the phone was off the hook, the caller would hear a busy signal when they dialed the phone. When a phone was exposed to extreme heat, the mechanism inside the unit can melt, and the phone might sometimes ring. Police also noted that a kitchen clock had stopped at 7.30 p.m. and a wall clock stopped at 7.53 p.m. The prosecution showed a videotape of Sandra's home. The judge would not allow close-ups of her body to avoid traumatizing the jury. Because of careless video editing, the jury saw Sandra's charred body. The jury was ordered to leave the courtroom. Defense attorney Boyle called for a mistrial, and prosecutor Paulus apologized. He claimed the close-up was a mistake. The judge called the prosecution sloppy and said no more visuals of Sandra Maloney's body, close-up or from a distance. Sandra Maloney's psychiatrist, Dr. John Stamm, testified on July 10, 1997. Sandra told him during a therapy session that John Maloney threatened to kill her. Bridget Boyle objected. Her dad and legal partner, Gerald Boyle, asked for another mistrial. The judge said he would allow threats to kill, but statements of speculation on what John Maloney might do were not admissible. Dr. Sam continued his testimony. Sandra was his patient from 1992 to 1997, and she abused alcohol and prescription drugs. She called him on June 19, 1996, and said John Maloney had beaten her. The doctor told her to go to a domestic violence shelter. He had seen bruises on her arm and face, but couldn't confirm that John Maloney caused them. Lieutenant Greg Urban testified and said Maloney was stressed over his impending divorce, over his wife's abuse issues, and was concerned about his boys. Urban found Maloney at his sister's home on February 11, 1998. He informed Maloney that his wife was killed in a fire. Maloney reacted by trembling uncontrollably. He cried for several minutes with his head in his hands. Maloney said the last time he had seen his wife was on February 4th. Tracy Helen Brand showed up and was equally shocked when she learned the news. She had not seen John for a week. Helen Brand hugged Maloney as she cried. Lieutenant Urban said the reaction seemed appropriate. Two days later, the Department of Criminal Investigation stepped in to handle the investigation when the death was ruled suspicious. Lieutenant Urban said that Maloney was asked where he was on February 10th and 11th and became hostile. On the fourth day of the trial, Las Vegas police detective Phil Ramos testified that John Maloney grabbed his girlfriend by the neck during an argument in their Las Vegas hotel room. The officer ran to the room to stop the argument, 
but it had subsided before he put the key card to the door. The incident took place on July 27, 1998, after 5 a.m. Ramos also called the room, pretending there was a noise complaint, then covertly asked Helen Brand if she needed help. She declined. The videotape was detrimental to Maloney's case, and he regretted how angry he was in Las Vegas. Special Agent Kim Skorlinski of the State Department of Criminal Investigation testified that Maloney could have strangled Sandra between 7 and 7.45 p.m. Investigators were certain that the crime occurred after 6.10 p.m. after Sandra had finished talking with her mother on the phone. Some people smelled smoke between 7.30 and 8 p.m. During initial interviews, Maloney and Helen Brand told police they did routine things like grocery shopping, laundry, and cooking dinner on the night of February 10th. But Helen Brand admitted she took a nap that night at the Menlo Park Road duplex where she lived with John Maloney. Maloney's alibi could not be confirmed from 7 to 7.45 p.m. And that was when Agent Skorlinski said he committed the murder. Maloney's defense team disagreed with the agent and said Helen Brand could have killed Maloney after work and before arriving home at 6.30 p.m. On the fifth day of the trial, Tracy Helen Brand took the stand. She said that John Maloney's divorce and mounting debts strained their relationship. On February 10th, 1998, Helen Brand told Maloney that she couldn't live like they were anymore. His divorce was dragging on, and she was done. Helen Brand cooked dinner for the kids, then went upstairs. She answered a phone call at 6.49 p.m. and fell asleep around 7 p.m. Helen Brand didn't see Maloney from 7 to 7.45 p.m. When she woke up from her nap, Maloney left the duplex at 7.52 p.m. to pick up his son from baseball and returned at 8.45 p.m. Helen Brand and John went shopping, and when they returned home, she felt like he was acting strange. When they went outside to smoke, he was shaking as he put a cigarette to his lips. Helen Brand said they attempted to have sex in front of the fireplace. When she removed his shirt, she claimed she could smell a potent scent on his skin. It smelled like he had been working out or had been in a cellar. Helen Brand initially thought Sandra's death was an accident. On February 25, 1998, after they ruled the death a homicide, she was willing to be recorded by police to prove Maloney was innocent. On April 29th, police shared details of the investigation with Helen Brand, and they convinced her he had committed the murder. She broke up with Maloney on April 30th and moved out of their duplex. On May 30th, Maloney was parked in his car outside of her mother's home in Madison with one of his sons asleep in the back seat. Helen Brand and Maloney argued for about two hours. Helen Brand drove away, and Maloney left his son, jumped in his car, and followed her while driving aggressively fast. Helen Brand started working with Agent Skorlinski. She offered to wear a wire, but wanted immunity from prosecution. On June 8, 1998, Helen Brand was given immunity, and her lawyer hammered out a written agreement with investigators. Helen Brand was a criminal investigator for the IRS, but had resigned. Her major concern was she lied on her IRS job application in 1994. She had also used the IRS database for personal reasons. She checked financial transactions for Sandra Maloney on February 10th. Agent Skorlinski told Helen Brand to stop having sex with Maloney because it would be problematic for the investigation. Helen Brand told the agent that sex was part of their relationship and he might suspect something was wrong if it didn't continue. Helen Brand tried to get a confession from Maloney on June 18th at her mother's home in Madison and also on July 7th, in a motel in Ashwaubenon. Both attempts were unsuccessful. Maloney suspected police were recording him, and he made Helen Brand strip off all her clothes every time they met so he could check for wires. 
Helen Brand moved to Vegas and invited Maloney to visit her. That was when she got him to admit he was at Sandra's house the evening she was murdered. On February 13, 1999, the sixth day of the trial, the Vegas videotape from July 27, 1998 was played for the jury. Helen Brand demanded that Maloney admit to killing his wife. Maloney denied the accusation. There was a lot of profanity and yelling. Their interactions were extremely heated, and it wasn't a good look for John Maloney. Helen Brand brought up the strange scent he had on his skin the night of Sandra's death. She told him she knew what murder smelled like. John Maloney admitted to being at Sandra's home the night she died, but said he did not injure her or start the fire. Maloney grew paranoid and told Helen Brand to check for hidden microphones behind a picture on the hotel's wall. He said he was at Sandra's house for five minutes. Sandra fell because she was intoxicated and hit her head, and that was when he left. Helen Brand had quit the IRS and was working as a hotel desk clerk. She received a call and gave Maloney the excuse that she was being called into work for a two-hour shift. The call was actually from a Las Vegas police detective telling her to wrap it up. They later arrested Maloney on July 28th. On Monday, February 15, 1999, defense attorney Gerald Boyle cross-examined Tracy Hellenbrand for five long hours. Boyle said she used sex to coerce Maloney into making confessions. Hellenbrand claimed Maloney admitted to choking his wife. She later rewarded him with oral sex for telling the truth. Helen Brand initially told investigators she took a nap at 7, then changed her mind and said she napped at 8 p.m. Then she told police after repeated interviews that there were two naps, one at 7 p.m. and one at 8 p.m. Her story kept changing. Maloney said that he was at home between 7 and 7.45 p.m. assembling bunk beds, and he left prior to 8 p.m. to pick up his oldest son from baseball practice. Boyle pointed out that Helen Brand had motive and means to commit the crime. Helen Brand gave Maloney thousands to help cover some of his debts. He was looking at owing Sandra up to $1,400 per month in maintenance fees. John's sister, Virginia Maloney, testified. She heard Helen Brand say that Sandra Maloney, quote-unquote, won't get my money. Judith, another of Maloney's sisters, testified she was present when Helen Brand was notified about Sandra Maloney's death. Helen Brand said, I'm not sorry she's dead. That solves all our problems. On February 16, 1999, the eighth day of the trial, Maloney's sons all testified. The two younger sons, Sean, age 11, and Aaron, age 10, thought their father was home from 7 to 7.45 p.m. on the night of their mother's murder. 14-year-old Matt was at baseball practice from 6 to 8 p.m. Prior to practice, he went to the store with his dad to pick up bolts for the beds. John Mullaney did not take the stand in his defense. The prosecutor and defense attorneys presented their closing arguments, and they sent away the jurors to deliberate the case. On February 17, 1999, after 11 hours, the jury had returned a verdict. John Maloney was guilty of first-degree intentional homicide in the death of Sandra Maloney. The Maloney boys started wailing, and the judge ordered they be removed from the courtroom before the rest of the judgments were given. Maloney was also guilty of arson and the mutilation of a corpse. During the deliberations, Jurors asked to see six specific pieces of evidence. John Maloney's statement to police, a statement by Helen Brand, a melted telephone that malfunctioned at the Hooth Street house the night of the fire, a fire investigator's report, the temporary order for the Maloney's divorce, and a document with details about John Maloney buying cigarettes near Sandra Maloney's home the night she was killed. After the trial, Sandra's mother addressed the media. Sandy is resting in peace, and that's what matters. I hope they have no hard feelings. 
Hopefully, we can bond as a family together for the boys. Prosecutor Joe Paulus added his commentary. It was very, very difficult to watch those three young boys sit in the courtroom and listen to verdicts against their father. I don't understand for the life of me why you would have those children in the courtroom at that time. In April 1999, at sentencing, John Maloney maintained his innocence. Maloney, who was wearing his prison orange, said, I did not commit this crime. I did not kill Sandy. I believe that I was manipulated, set up to make it appear that I did commit this crime. The judge sentenced Maloney to life in prison, which meant 25 years with his first chance at parole on February 10, 2024. He received 10 years for mutilating a corpse and 4 years for the arson. Maloney's sons were notably not in the courtroom for the hearing. The prosecutor was disappointed with the sentence and hoped that Maloney would die in prison. District Attorney Paulus said, I've had non-murder cases where defendants had received longer sentences. We're disappointed. There is no place for Mr. Maloney in society and he should have just been behind bars for the rest of his life. After John Maloney's arrest and conviction, there was an issue with whom was going to be the guardian for the Maloney boys. They lived with their father for most of the Maloney separation. John Maloney's sister, Virginia, helped care for the boys, and they had been staying with her in Green Bay since their father's arrest. After the trial, Sandra's sister and brother-in-law, Wendy and Al Kennard, filed for guardianship of the three Maloney boys. John Maloney's sister, Virginia, also filed for guardianship. Wendy reconsidered her position after the sentencing hearing and withdrew her claim on the children. She did not want to move the kids out of Green Bay because they grew up in that city and were established in the schools there. Wendy did not want to destabilize their lives since they lost so much. Maloney appealed his case in September 2000. He argued the defense should have been allowed to question Helen Brand about taking the polygraph test and using techniques to deceive the test. When she was confronted with the matter, she admitted she was a compulsive liar. The defense argued that Helen Brand was acting as a law enforcement officer, given she was a criminal investigator for the IRS. John Maloney's appeal was denied. Maloney appealed his case again on June 10, 2005, at the state Supreme Court level. He said his trial counsel was ineffective. The court received transcripts from Maloney's case when it aired on 48 Hours in March 2005. One of the main points of the TV show was that prosecutor Joe Paulus was convicted in 2004 for misconduct. He had accepted bribes for misdemeanor and traffic charges and then dished out better outcomes for defendants. Hollywood Joe Paulus was convicted and served six years in federal prison in Florida. Maloney accused Paulus of heavily editing the Vegas videotapes, implicating him in Sanders' death. John Maloney's appeal was denied. In 2006, Ira Robbins, an investigator who worked with the Maloney family, wanted the state Supreme Court to look at his case again. Robbins said Greg Agum, the arson investigator, falsified burn tests in February 1998 and that his ruling on the arson influenced the medical examiner, Greg Schmunk, to rule Sandra Maloney's death as a homicide. The tests that Agum performed on the vodka were questionable. Investigators said that Maloney poured vodka on the floor by the couch and used it as an accelerant. James Munger, a prominent fire investigator, tried to recreate the burn with the same type of carpet that was in Sandra's home and vodka. He couldn't get the vodka to ignite for more than a few seconds at a time because vodka is mostly water. He felt the conclusions made by the arson investigator, Agum, were based on junk science. Munger believed that Sandra, who was intoxicated and mishandled her cigarettes, accidentally caused the fire. In an affidavit, medical examiner Greg Schmunk said several pieces of evidence were withheld by Agent Skorlinski, 
when he determined Sandra's death was a homicide in February 1998. Sandra Maloney's blood was not found on the first floor of her home where she died. Blood was found in many areas of the basement, including the bathroom and the shower. There was blood in the laundry room found on towels and on Sandy's shirt. An extension cord was slung from the ceiling and appeared to be a makeshift noose. Five suicide notes were found in a garbage can. One note read, John, how can you throw everything away? Take care of the kids. I'm done fighting. The medical examiner said if he had known this information, he might have amended her death to undetermined. The Maloney family agrees with the theory that Sandra tried to commit suicide but failed, and her life was ended accidentally after hitting her head while intoxicated and being careless with her smoking materials. Matt, Sean, and Aaron Maloney all strongly believed in their father's innocence. Matt said Sandra's addiction to pills splintered the family. When she couldn't get her doctors to prescribe her pills, she would get them from her friends. The local pharmacist would even have the boys take any prescription medication in front of them to prevent their mom from stealing it. Sandra instructed her sons to place their medication under their tongue and hold it there until they left the pharmacy. Once outside, the boys would spit the pills out and Sandra would take the medication. At that time, the boys were too young to consider the gravity of the situation. Sean would find vodka bottles all over their home. Sandra told her therapist that John was physically abusive. Sean disagreed with this and said that when his parents fought, it was his mom hitting his dad. If anything, his mom was an alcoholic, and the bruises were a result of her taking drunken falls. Sandra might have been trying to gain sympathy from her therapist, so he would prescribe her more medication. Sean said, The Maloney family is not giving up on my dad. We love him, and we know the truth. I believe in my dad, and I will fight until he is by my side. Matt Maloney added, If there's any way I thought my dad killed my mom, I would have nothing to do with this case right now. I would not see my dad. I would not talk to him at all. It's our mom that died. Why would we cover up for that? John's sister Virginia raised the boys and took them regularly to see their dad in prison. The Maloney family experienced another significant loss in 2018 when Virginia Maloney passed away. Matt and Aaron Maloney live in Green Bay, and Sean Maloney lives in Milwaukee. John Maloney remains incarcerated at Dodge Correctional Institution in Waupon, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for the links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and sound design were performed by me, Renee. I want to thank patrons Rachel S. and Martina Q. Thank you for supporting the show. If you like the show, please leave me a positive review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much, everyone.